Hi everybody, David here from Via Render. Thanks for taking the time to check out this video. In this video, I want to talk about two things that are linked, but kind of done differently in D5, and that is fire and water. Okay, let's take a quick look at the scene that we have here. So we've got a pretty basic setup. We've got kind of an ornamental section. We're going to have water on this blue area and fire in this bowl. And we've also got basically a kind of uh, array of trees back here. You'll notice that these are in fact D5 trees. They were just rendered out, um, basically just assembled like 20 or 30 of them, put them in a line, put a green grass plane underneath, and then just rendered that out as an image and went ahead and applied it to a curved plane here in SketchUp. Um, I'd love to claim responsibility for that, but that is actually something I learned from Nuno Silva. Uh, I'll link out to his video where he talks about this. It's a really cheap and uh, really efficient way to build an environment, especially because the poly count for this plane is a lot, lot, lot less than putting in, you know, hundreds of trees. All right, pretty basic setup, and we've got a grass plane here. All right. Over in D5, I've gone ahead and assigned some materials. And the first thing that we wanna talk about is fire. So I'm gonna move over here to this grass area. And I'm actually gonna just position my camera right here. And how we get fire in D5, hit M on the keyboard, and not under material or model, but under particles. And when we do that, you can see we've got a whole bunch of particle options within D5. Okay, the one we're looking for though is going to be fire. And the easiest way to work with this is quite simply just pick fire from the left here. And now you can see we've got one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight different options. I'm gonna go ahead and place two. This is uh, something that's kind of confusing, I think a little bit. Um, initially, when I first started looking at this, I was sort of under the impression that they're all actually the same thing, but they're really kind of not. Let's take a look at two different fires. I'm gonna do fire five, and I'm gonna place it. I'm gonna also use fire six, and I'm going to place it. Now, if you go ahead and do this, you may place this and see absolutely nothing. And you may be thinking, okay, what's wrong with D5? To get these effects to function, you do have to go up to display and turn on real time. Now, they will appear static like this, but sometimes I found if you go ahead and just place it, what you'll get is that, basically nothing. So in order to really see this working, you need to be able to go up to display and turn on real time. Okay. Now, I mentioned that I thought that all of these looked the same. I thought they were really just variations on a theme, but I think they're actually a little bit more than that. I do think particularly these Fire 1, 5, and 6, and even 3, that look very similar are actually substantially different. I'm going to go ahead and change the lighting environment a little bit here. Let's make it a little darker, and this will take a minute to update. And what I mean by that is um, really just... If you look here and here, you can actually see the profile, if you will, the sort of fire, the actual makeup of the fire is quite different. I assumed that they were the same thing, just slightly wider or taller, but I don't think that's actually true. I do think they are individualized assets. And you can see there's kind of a difference in sort of the frequency, the intensity of the flame, and even just the overall flame size. So that's just something to be mindful of as you work with these flame assets. Let's go ahead and delete this little one over here. All right, I'm gonna go ahead and just increase the brightness just a little bit here. When it comes to working with the flames in D5, there's just really a few things to note. The first is that there aren't a huge amount of options other than picking the flame you want. If we go ahead and select it, you'll notice really the only parameter we have to change here is the actual size. And you'll notice that when we do that, it sort of effectively changes the emitter size and it will kind of affect the look and feel of your flame. Now you wanna really avoid like cranking this up really high. Um, and you also wanna try maybe in avoiding the really low levels because you can see when you do that, you can kind of get this weird kind of clustering effect. So keeping it within kind of the relative paradigms that D5 has established is probably a good way to go. I, you know, don't try and make it too small and don't try and make it too large. Now, 
One last thing on this. You'll notice that there is procedurally generated smoke as well. And you may be thinking, well, I want to go ahead and just add a little bit of smoke. Yeah, you can. You can actually do that by going up to the D5 render assets and looking under smoke. Now, I haven't used these extensively. You do need to be slightly mindful of how big these smoke assets actually are. So, for example, some of them are actually better suited to an entire street. So here you can see, I've gone ahead and placed smoke number eight. And if I turn off the little asset library there, you can kind of see it over here. It really is affecting really quite a large area. And this is not necessarily what we want. This is more akin to the sort of smoke effect you'd get on maybe a street scene or a nighttime urban scene. Um, and it's really, you know, I wouldn't necessarily say it's a great way to hide things but you probably could use it to hide, for example, the horizon line or hide any problems in your scene, but not necessarily ideal for, you know, just giving the plume of smoke. For those, you may want to look at the smoke one and smoke five, try and get something a little bit more natural looking. All right. I mentioned two things that I want to talk about this. One is obviously the size. The second is something you may be aware of. Uh, just by looking at this scene, and that is that these flames, these procedurally sort of generated emitter-based uh, fire assets, do not emit light. So if your fire in your scene obviously is not emitting light, is there an easy fix for that? Well, yes, there is a kind of cheat, and this one will be familiar to Twin Motion or Lumion users. And what we're actually going to do is place a light within the fire. Let's go ahead and turn the brightness really off. All right, we're at 12. And you can see we should be getting a glow effect here if this was a little bit more sort of physically based. But we're not. So let's fake it. Let's go up to lights. And we're going to add a point light. And what I'm actually going to do is place it right in the center of our flame where you would have the highest level of illumination. And you can see, ooh, definitely getting more of the rocks and the kind of concrete environment, but it's really, really strong. What we're going to do is turn off visible and reflections. We don't need to see that light in our actual reflections. I'm going to change the temperature to be quite orange. And you can see if I crank it to the left here, it's really strong. Let's put it about here. And what we're going to do then is drop the attenuation radius. And I'm going to take this down. Don't worry too much about how bright it is. Let's just go ahead and bring that down. Yeah, I think that looks really nice. All right, cool. Let's go ahead then and adjust the intensity. Now, there is a problem here. The lowest you can take this down to is really like basically kind of one. And that, that kind of works a little bit but it's still probably a little too bright. So what you can do is just manually type in 0 0.2, hit enter, and there we go. We're getting a nice glow going on. We could probably take this up to 0 0.4, and I think that's really, really nice. Now we can keep tweaking the temperature value, but that should give the sort of effect of a warm glow, basically light energy being emitted from your fire. It's a simple fix and should be relatively easy to set up no matter what scene you're working on. Okay, that's fire taken care of. Let's talk about water. All right, so right now I've gotten a wood surface here and I'm gonna hit M on the keyboard, bring back up the asset library and we're gonna ignore the particles for now. We don't need them anymore. Water is actually going to be under a material. And so if we scroll all the way down here, I'm just going to tab these, close these out. And you can see that if we go to our outdoor tab, we've got water. Now we do have quite a lot of different water models or at least materials to choose from. Now I'm just going to show you, I don't necessarily think that there's a huge amount of difference between these. If I go ahead and just apply this, if you look at the settings over here on the right, we've got refraction, flow, depth. And if I go ahead and change this, the only thing that seems to be changing here is again, the refraction, the flow and the depth. So the simplest thing you might want to do is really just start with one of the basic ones. I'm going to use the blue pool water ripple number two, and I'm just going to go ahead and apply that. And so 
what that gives us is a very simple material template that we can mess with. And you can see over here, we've got base color. And so we could go ahead and we could change that to whatever we want, whatever kind of material base color we want it to be. You can somewhat see it reflected a little bit in the viewport that changes. And by the way, we are still on real time. If we turn that off, you'll see we get a static version of the material. Now, I'm going to go ahead and just reapply a basic one of these. And we've got options then for refraction. And you can see if I kind of tweak this a little bit, effectively, this is going to be how much light is going to be distorted or bent as it goes through your water. Um, if you've used glass materials, this should be relatively familiar to you. And so I'm going to go ahead and just put this back to 1.5. I haven't really found any reason where you might want to change that too much. We will, however, want to change the flow velocity. You can see you can take this really high up if you wanted your water to be moving at a really fast speed. Now, it's unlikely that you'll be doing that for a lot of like ArcViz renders, but just be mindful that you can go ahead and change that. One thing that you can be mindful of when it comes to water though in D5 is the normal map. So I'm gonna go ahead and just turn off the flow on this and I'm gonna crank this material really high and we can adjust the scale maybe just a little bit and I just hopefully you guys can kind of see this. So the normal map here is where a lot of the ripples are actually coming from. If I reverse it, you can kind of see that it'll reverse the effectively the direction of the normal map. And so you can have a very low flow, but you can actually also have, let's take this down to 0. Point, uh, there we go, 0 0.01, 0 0.01 and you can have pretty pronounced ripple effect. Um, could, could be really nice if you're doing kind of something that you want to mimic, maybe a watercolor painting. It could be a very cheap way of doing that just by really cranking the normal and maybe just adjusting the refraction. In other words, how reflective, if you will, and how distortion-y the water is. I don't think distortion-y is a word, but there you go. For our purposes though, let's just go ahead and apply a blue pool water. And we are going to reduce the flow velocity quite low. The other thing that you can see here is the depth option. Now, this will become kind of important if you're doing anything where really you want to be able to see through the water into the land. In other words, if you've got an area where water meets the land quite softly, maybe the house model you're working on backs up to a river or backs up to a lake, and you want a smoother transition from water to the bank land to maybe the ground, well then this is going to become kind of useful. By default, it'll be quite high. So you're, you're getting a very kind of solid, almost harsh transition from where objects meet the water. And if we go ahead and change this, you can kind of see now, I can actually see much further into the actual bottom of the water. Now, this also brings up one other thing that you do need to be sort of mindful of, and that is modeling underneath your water. So you can see here, um, if I go back to SketchUp, here's my grass plane. And you gotta be kind of careful about this. By default, this would be its own group and it would be under my model. Now there's a very good chance that if you're not careful with the water and you don't build this correctly, and you're not mindful maybe of the depth slider, there's a chance that you'll actually see right through the water into whatever's underneath. And so if you don't build your scene correctly, and by that I mean, if you don't build it the way it would probably be constructed, there's a very good chance that you'll actually see right through it. So just be careful of that. And so the last thing I want to talk about with water is just to be mindful of the reflectivity of water. Now, this you can obviously see in this scene right here. The water is doing a great job of reflecting and giving that nice soft ripple effect of the trees in the environment. But you can also do some pretty fun stuff with this in terms of modeling. You can set up some really nice shots. I'm going to go ahead and just search for a quick boat really, really quickly. And let's go ahead and just grab this little uh, sailboat. And I'm going to go ahead and scale this down. Just place this in the scene. There we go. 
comes in pretty large. So just hit V on the keyboard and scale it properly down. And I'm just gonna go ahead and just zoom in a little bit here. So you can see almost immediately that this asset is almost perfectly reflected in the water. I think it looks absolutely superb. Um, you can also like do this without having to worry about reflection planes or refraction or anything like that. Even reflection probes, whether you're coming from Lumion or Twin Motion or something similar to that, you don't have to worry about this. The water in D5 is going to act realistically just off the bat without having to put a huge amount of effort in. And even just pulling the camera back here and looking, this looks really, really good. And with that being said, thank you so much for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.